Welcome to uh, Custom Materials and Fluids. Uh, my name is Corey Bauer, Application Engineer at Go Engineer. And in the next 20 to 30 minutes, we're going to talk a little bit about where we can get custom materials or how we can create custom materials. Uh, SOLIDWORKS has a web portal where we can get materials from. We can also manually create materials and we can also manually create fluids for CFD. If we want to use the SOLIDWORKS material web portal that is powered by materiality and it's included in licenses of simulation professional or simulation premium. Uh, we act One way to access this uh, material portal is through the material library where we define uh, our materials in the study. Uh, once we get to the portal, we do some filtering and we can look at our materials. So when we want to add our material in SOLIDWORKS or simulation, uh, when we right click on the material editor, we have an option down here at the bottom if we have simulation add-on turned on. So right here it says click here to get more materials, but if we don't have simulation turned on. When we apply our material, that message is not there. Okay, again, that's because it is only available when you have simulation professional or simulation premium. So we'll apply our material. We'll go ahead and go into the web portal. It also tells us again um, what what licenses allow you to have the material portal. Okay, so powered by materiality. And the first thing we do is filter by the study type. So whether we want static, nonlinear, frequency, buckling, dynamic, drop test, thermal, steady state, thermal transient, or all studies. Uh, for this example, we'll just uh, get material data for linear static um, analysis. Okay, tells us which material model. So if we were doing a nonlinear um, study, it would choose from a couple different material models for material data. Uh, we can also get materials with thermal loading information, factor of safety, and fatigue uh, built in. Next step is to filter by the class of material. So if we want to look at the metals, and then we choose what subclass we want. So we'll just look at steel. Okay. We have four different databases that we can choose from. So we're just going to start with the global database. And then we'll just hit find material. Okay. You cannot search by materials by name. You have to look down through the list to find the material that you want. So we'll just pick the first material and that's going to bring up its material properties. Okay. Some of the other information. And if that's the material we want, the next step is to download that material file. And we have um, once we download that SOLIDWORKS material library, we need to put it into a folder and then we need to tell SOLIDWORKS where to get that um, material. So if we hit download, it's going to be a SOLIDWORKS material file. Okay. So once we download that material file, put it in the folder we want, next thing we have to do is go to Tools Options. Go to File Locations, and we need to scroll down to our Material Databases, and we just add the path to that new folder that we saved the material in. Once we do that, when we go to edit and add our materials, it'll now be down here at the 
uh, below the SOLIDWORKS materials, it'll be that new material. Okay. So that's how we would use the SOLIDWORKS web portal to get materials. The next thing we want to look at is how would we create a material in SOLIDWORKS. When we create a new material in SOLIDWORKS, we can enter in all of the needed mechanical properties. Uh, one thing you need to know about the materials in the default SOLIDWORKS database is they are read-only. Okay, so we can't edit, modify, or adjust any of the SOLIDWORKS materials, uh, but we can create our own new materials. first thing you have to do to create a new material is to create a category for it. So you come down here to custom materials which will be at the bottom of your material library and you create a new category. Once you create that category you just right click on the name of that category and create a new material. We just give that material a name. And then now all the different fields are live that we can enter the mechanical properties. So let's take a look at, in detail, those mechanical properties. So the first property that we need to enter in is the elastic modulus, also known as Young's modulus. And that's the ratio between the stress and strain in a material. Uh, also can be defined as the slope of the linear portion of our stress strain curve. So if we see on the left side here, we have a sample stress strain curve. So we've got the linear portion and then we've got our yield or plastic um, deformation. Okay. So the slope of that linear portion is our elastic modulus. Okay. It is a measure of the stiffness of the material. So the stiffer the material is, the higher its elastic modulus will be. What it isn't is not uh, strength. So stiffness is not the same as strength. Okay. Uh, typically these values are from a lab in a tensile test. A couple of sample uh, stress strain curves superimposed. So we've got a brittle material. Okay, so it's got a very steep slope. We've got a classic metal. So it's got a linear portion and then a uh, nonlinear portion. And then we've got a plastic uh, that has little to no um, linear region and goes right into um, nonlinear. Similar to the elastic modulus is the shear modulus, uh, also known as the modulus of rigidity. Okay. Almost same definition. Uh, difference is this is the ratio between the shearing stress and the associated shearing strain. Okay. Uh, it's also a measure of the stiffness. And again, a rigid material will have a higher shear modulus. And it's the resistance to transverse deformations. Okay, So this is loading that causes uh, shear rather than um, tensile loading. Okay, um, Both of these properties are used in static studies, nonlinear studies, frequency studies, dynamic studies, and buckling. The next material property that we need to define is Poisson's ratio. And this is the ratio between um, expansion in one direction and contraction in the other direction. Okay, So if we pull on a specimen in tension, as it gets longer, it's going to tend to neck down or get thinner um, in the other direction. Okay, These values can be negative 1 to 0.5. Uh, steels and rigid polymers are around 0.3. Rubber has a Poisson's ratio of nearly 0.5.
and very few materials have um, negative Poisson's ratios. Uh, polymer foams are one, so that means as you pull on in one direction, it actually expands in the other direction as well. Okay, uh, these this material property is used in a static study, nonlinear frequency, dynamic, and buckling. The next material property that we define is the coefficient of thermal expansion. And that is the change in length per unit length for one degree change in temperature. Okay. Uh, for many metals, this can be inversely proportioned to the melting temperature, the melting point. Uh, it can be negative in small temperature ranges for certain materials. Uh, water and pure silicone are examples of that. And liquids tend to be higher than solids. So you can see in our image, we've got our initial um, volume, and then we've got our expansion due to heat. Uh, these are used for static frequency and buckling. The next material property that we define is thermal conductivity, and that's the effectiveness of a material to transfer heat by conduction. Uh, metals tend to have a higher thermal conductivity due to the fact that the electrons are helping conduct the heat. Um, Non-metallic solids are lower because that's typically uh, lattice vibrations that are transferring the heat rather than electrons. Okay, And these are used in steady state thermal and transient thermal analysis. The next material property that we define is density, and that is the mass per unit volume. And that is dictated by the number of atoms, their mass, and their arrangement in that model. Um, relative density or specific gravity uh, is another measure of density, and that's just compared to water. So it's a ratio to water. And then specific volume is the reciprocal of density. So that's commonly used uh, also. This property is used in static, nonlinear, frequency, dynamic, buckling, and thermal. Another property we need to define is specific heat. And this is the amount of heat needed to raise the temperature of a unit of mass by one degree. And the higher the specific heat is, the better the solid is at storing heat energy. And non-metals are typically higher than metals. Uh, this property is only used in a transient thermal analysis. Okay. So that is the two different ways that we can create our solid materials. Now we're going to look at how we add fluids um, to the flow database. Okay, We access the flow database by going into the flow menu, tools, engineering database. The engineering database stores everything that flow uses in one way or another. So the area we want to look at is in our materials. So this is where our compressible liquids, our gases, our regular liquids, our non-Newtonian liquids, our real gases, our solids, and our steams are. We're going to start with liquids. And these are the properties that we need for a liquid. So we need the density, dynamic viscosity, um, specific heat, thermal conductivity, and whether cavitation is allowed or not. So dynamic viscosity is the tangential force required to move one plate with respect to another. Uh, it's a measure of the internal resistance or shearing of our fluid. Um, it is uh, really the intermolecular friction is what's causing 
um, the dynamic viscosity. And the higher the viscosity, the higher the resistance is to shearing. Uh, so oftentimes for liquids, um, it's a test apparatus that has a, a fluid poured into a tube. It's got a rotating spindle and the torque is measured to uh, rotate uh, that spindle. So that's how we get the viscosity. Specific heat, um, same as for a solid, the amount of heat needed to raise um, the temperature by one degree. Uh, for liquids, it's a typically a higher value um, than solids. And again, the higher the specific heat, the better the liquid is at storing that heat. Thermal conductivity. Uh, same as in a solid, uh, it's just the effectiveness of that liquid in transferring heat through it. So you've got the hot side and the cold side and how well it transfers that heat uh, through the material. Uh, cavitation effect is um, a way to predict phase transition caused by pressure um, reduction. Okay. Uh, also increased temperature in the case of boiling. Uh, currently, this is only available for our predefined water. For our gases, uh, we have some of the same properties and a couple of different ones. Um, one that's different is our uh, specific heat ratio. So specific heat for constant pressure over the specific heat for constant volume. Uh, we define the molecular mass. And again, viscosity, specific heat, and thermal conductivity. So the specific heat ratio is just the specific heat at constant pressure uh, divided by the specific heat at constant volume. Molecular mass is the mass of one molecule of substance. Uh, it typically is represented as relative to the mass of uh, a carbon-12 molecule. And molecular ma mass is not equal to molar mass. Molar mass is the mass of one mole of a substance, not one molecule. Dynamic viscosity again, resistance to shear or flow and in gases it typically increases with temperature instead of decreases. Okay. Specific heat, um, same definition as it was for solids and liquids and same thing with our thermal conductivity. Okay. How well that gas is at transferring heat uh, due to conduction. So those are the ways that we create um, custom materials and fluids um, and a detailed description of each of the properties that need to be defined. This has been Corey Bauer uh, with Go Engineer, uh, going through custom materials and fluids. Thank you. Mm -hmm.